Join together in our opening prayer. Dear God, Father in heaven, we thank you for the country that you have seen to it that we are able to live in. And we thank you for the people in the colonial days that you prompted to write this constitution that we're going to be talking about. Now, Lord, please help us to understand and to be able to put into practice what we'll be studying today. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Introducing our speaker, most of you who are here know him, and that's why you're here. <laughs> but as you do know, Art Gehrman, for many years, has been an expert and has done research <coughs> on this topic of the origins. And as you also know, over the years, he has formed groups that get together and do things. And even now, there is a group centered here uh, called called Reaching People in the Public Square, and Art was the idea for that, and the, and the person who has brought that group together. And so we're, Art is eminently qualified to speak with us. Here's his plan. Uh, this is being videotaped. And um, our, our pastor, Robin, will, will be able to f tell us later how you can access this videotape down the road or get a DVD of this. So you may discover this is something you want to share. And because it's being videotaped, that will be possible. Art's plan is to talk to us until about 22, quarter two, and then becomes the most important part, which is answering your questions. So as they come up, just keep jotting down your ideas. And let's now welcome by clapping Art to come to speak to us. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for coming here on this beautiful fall day. Uh, just as a matter of introduction for those people that may not know me, uh, I'm Art Gehrman. I've been a, a member here of Emanuel for 32 years and uh, also a student of the Constitution probably 15 to 20 years. And uh, previously, uh, I headed up a constitutional educational group uh, here at Loveland for about six years. Uh, we, our role was to educate the people on current events and on the Constitution. And I was asked by one person if I was preaching to the choir here today. <laughs> and my response was that I hope that you start preaching to the choir. Uh, in other words, for what you can gather here today, what morsels you'll pick up, I uh, certainly would encourage uh, you to speak with your neighbors and speak with your friends and your relatives because we're, as you know, our country is in many respects upside down right now and we need the hand of the Lord to step in. It's getting pretty serious. Uh, some folks have said that we are in a state of... Uh, uh, age of post-constitutional era. We're in a post-constitutional era. And I'm going to open up with some comments, personal, uh, speaking about individuals, organizations, and education that may give us some hint as to where we are in our culture today. And after that, I will take you on a quick tour uh, of close to 200 years of history, which will end up at the uh, Bill of Rights, the Liberty Amendments, in 1792. Uh, and, and after that quick travel, I hope to spend some time on specific topics so that you have a better understanding of how this government was formed. So again, I thank you. And um, let me start off by saying that uh, the, reasons, uh, the reason I'm here is I have concerns, and I hope you do, about us returning back to our roots. Our tree, our constitution is a tree that has roots. And you are the roots, and they gotta be watered. The tree is gonna die. Uh, right now, I, I think about two years ago, uh, I was uh, having lunch with a, a lady friend of mine, and as we entered the restaurant, uh, somebody yelled out her name and said hi. And so we went over to talk to them, and of course I didn't know her friends. So she introduced me to her friends, 
And the one lady said to me, I know you. And I looked at her, I, I didn't recall her face or name. And she says, I know you from the paper. You're the Constitution guy. <laughs> and I said, are you interested in Constitution government? And she said, oh, no, the government's in Denver and it's in Washington. What's wrong with that statement? Anybody? Anybody like to volunteer? What's wrong with that statement? Where is the government? Citizens. Individual. In your house? Citizens. Yep. And then, um, then I'd like to read you some statistics about where we are as a nation in terms of our participation at the voting booths. In the 2016 election, we have 80 million people that did not vote. And of that number, how many think, how many people you think might be Christians? One quarter, one third, one half? Anybody half. like to take a stab at it? Go ahead. Half. Half. Uh, not quite. A third. 25 million people did not vote in the 2016 election. They were Christian, that claimed to be Christian. Of that number of Christians at your local elections, like here in Loveland, guess how many people voted in the local elections, percentage-wise? Anybody want to take a stab at it? A third. Well, I don't know about numbers, but in terms of uh, percentage, it was 6%. That's a very low number, isn't it? Yeah. And then, uh, the lady down the street, you ask her if she's voting, she says, oh, my voting doesn't count. My vote doesn't count. Have you heard that number? Many times, right? My vote doesn't count? She's right. It doesn't count. She don't make it, it don't count. Okay. <laughs> now, in the last, a uh, couple city council elections, or at least the last, what are the elections for council people? We had a runoff in one election, and that person in the runoff won by one vote. We had another election for another council lady. She won by three votes. So a vote doesn't count, does it? Now, this the state of mind uh, is spread into our educational institutions. We've heard many times people say that, you know, our kids are not getting a good education on, our, on, a, on a constitution. Uh, Pastor Ed Seeley and I were at lunch with the editor of the local newspaper here a couple of weeks ago. And we asked, what, we asked this editor of this newspaper, what's coming out of our journalistic journal schools? People learning to become journalists. You know what his answer was? They're advocates, they're not reporters. Which means what? They're coming out with what? An agenda. And they're learning this from the professors. Our kids' minds are being poisoned with misinformation. And I know your children, your grandkids, they gotta be talked got they gotta be talked to about what to go to these universities because they gotta learn to check both sides of the story, not just one. To expand this in just one more item, is that a couple, few weeks ago, uh, two professors, one from Harvard and one from Yale, did an op-ed article in the New York Times, and here's what they said. Recently, they recently wrote in the op-ed column, the Constitution is broken, I'm quoting. The Constitution is broken, uh, and, and it's appeared in the New York Times, and they, they say, quote, it's time to move on to a more democratic process without the burden of the Constitution. That's heresy. These are coming from our professors at our universities. Now, these are the things that concern me. Uh, I think we need to become more apprised, more interested in our government. We may lose it if we don't.
And now I'm going to take you back on a journey starting from the beginning. Uh, as we all know, we've all heard of the pilgrims. Uh, the colonists came here in the 1600s, and their reasons for coming were many, including poverty, the Church of England, and looking for a better life. And Britain was looking to expand its empire, so they're bringing people here to this country in the 1600s. The colonization period lasted 100 years, and went from 1600 to 1700. I'm not going to go into all the detail of that, but right now you should have a copy of the events that occurred from the time of the pilgrims in the 1600s to the uh, U.S. Constitution when it was developed. And it's all in it's chronology. It's all in order for time. And I will be talking on some of these items, but not all will be time. But certainly you're welcome to ask questions if you see something on that sheet that may catch your attention you need to talk about. On the other sheets, you have constitution definitions. We don't have those. All we've got is the uh, oh, constitution definitions. Yeah, we got that. You have that one? Good. Uh, I'm not going to spend uh, time right now, on, uh, although we'll be covering this in some of my talk. But one thing I want to make sure we understand here before we leave today, we do not live in a pure democracy. You understand what I'm saying? A pure democracy is when every, the, the majority always votes, the majority counts. Uh, we live in a constitutional, finish? Republic. Republic. And why was this chosen? This form of government. I'm going to come back to that. We talked about James Madison. He'll explain the reasons why we have a, a, a constitutional republic or a democratic republic. We have a democratic republic. We have democracy through agency. We don't vote directly. Who votes? Our representatives. That's what a constitutional republic is. And I'll come back to the reasons why our founders went to this idea instead of democracy. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so now with regard to the uh, beginning of uh, our history, the British Empire was being expanded in the 1600s. And I'll just briefly say in your timetable with the Revolutionary War, that was a war between Britain and France. They were both expanding their empires at that time, back in the, uh, what year was that, the 1700s? That's what goes farther back than that, 1600s. And um, the people came here uh, under British rule. Uh, the population of the colonies at that time was primarily British or English, some from other countries. Germany is one, by the way. Uh, the colonists lived under the British rule for over 150 years. Long time. Uh, their ruling body was one house. One house? Can you step back? And each colony had one boat uh, in this, in this uh, one house, and they had governors that were appointed by Britain. So they really were under the thumbs of Great Britain. They really didn't have complete freedom. And uh, during the course of this 150 years, some bad things began to happen uh, with the colonists in Britain because Britain was getting heavily in debt with the wars it was engaged in, and they were trying to make, pay the bills. So they figured one way to do it is get to the colonists, help them pay the bills. So he started imposing stamp, uh, taxes, like the tea tax and the stamp tax, stamp act. And uh, the colonists started to resist. In fact, one of the fun games they played uh, was our good friend Sam, uh, James, well, not James, but uh, Sam Adams under the Liberty Boys, they, they dumped 90,000 pounds of tea into Boston Harbor at the famous tea party. That was their party, 90,000 pounds. 
and Great Britain didn't take this too easily. So they started to attack the, the, uh, their mercantile ships on the seas and started a banning of, of trading and they shut down the Boston Harbor. And all these events started to accumulate and the, the colonists began to become frustrated, started to say, well, maybe this relationship with Britain's not that good. So uh, as these grievances increased, uh, James uh, uh, James Adams was the uh, ambassador to Britain. He started to interact with the British Parliament and King George to see if we get resolution on the, on these issues that were going on with the colonists. That were the colonists began to rebel, and this lasted for a number of years. And finally, in December of uh, 1775, uh, James uh, Adams, John Adams, John Adams gave the last warning to Britain that if they didn't resolve these issues within six months, now we're talking about December 1775, now we're moving into July, and it was decided that enough is enough. So this is what Thomas Jefferson wrote his letter to who? King George III and to the British Parliament. And in that letter, he listed the 27 grievances that were not addressed by Britain. And by the way, these grievances are listed in the Declaration of independence. If you read it, you will see those 27 greetings. That's what he included in that document. And King George uh, resisted that. And uh, the colonies then decided it was time to sever their relationship. And Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Um, so now the 13 colonies have become 13 states. Now, colonies had an interesting situation because they're no longer under the uh, governance, go the governance of Britain. They had to form their own government. So they decided that they would form a, a, a confederation congress, congress of confederate, confederate congress. And in that congress, they came up with, I think, 13 different articles of confederation, bringing these 13 states, newly formed states together. And, uh, decided that they would have one house and one vote per state. The problem with this, this Congress was they require a 100% vote for passing anything. Now we have 13, visualize, we have 13 states independent that have their own armies, they have their own, they printed their own money, they had their own commerce, they had their own laws, they had their own judicial system. So they were all competing with each other. So when I came to make decisions in the uh, Confederate Congress, guess what? Nothing happened. They could never uh, come to agreements. So a uh, good friend, Alexander Hamilton, was one of the first people to say enough's enough with this Congress. It's not working. We have to do something about it. So he called for a uh, convention uh, in Maryland uh, to see if they could amend the Articles of Confederation because of the weaknesses that occurred. And uh, unfortunately, he did not gain approval from the Congress to make that happen. <laughs> so uh, a few months later, uh, James Madison, uh, decided that, well, maybe we should convene in Philadelphia and see if we could amend the Articles of Confederation. So in May of, of 1770, 1787, a convention was called, the Constitutional Convention was called in Philadelphia. And at that time, uh, delegates from all but one state came to be represented in that Constitutional Convention, guess what state it was? Anybody remember? Rhode Island. Who said that? Thanks, Paul. Right on. 
Uh, so, uh, by the way, they did not ever send any delegates to the, con to the convention. They did finally ratify it later. But in any event, uh, in the uh, convention started in May of 1787, uh, my, my son's currently reading a book, which I think I'd recommend to all of you. It's on the page here, the first page. It's the summer of 1787. The deliberation went on for five months to form the Constitution. And I'm gonna come back to some of the mindsets that occurred after I finished my travel log with you. Uh, but I rec highly recommend that book, it's on your list. Summer of 1787. So now that what the convention uh, called, uh, it took five months for them to put together this document, which in my opinion was one of those. It was a document of genius. Thomas Jefferson supplied, Thomas Jefferson supplied, uh, uh, loads of information for, for James Madison to analyze governments. Well, some historians say they went back a thousand years studying Confederate governments like we started with. None of them succeeded, they all failed. And I'm gonna come back to what James Madison came up with after that, after I finish these other thoughts. Uh, but some people speculate the first De uh, democratic government, the republic, was where and when? Maybe you'd like to take a stab at that. Greece. Where? Greece. Greece. Could we go back farther than Greece? Could we go back Bible times? Who's Moses' father-in-law? Jethro? Jethro? Moses came to his father-in-law one day and said, I cannot handle all the problems of these 12 tribes. And his father-in-law said, Moses, here's what you do. You appoint a representative from each tribe to deal with the problems. And if they, if they the tribe, the leader of that tribe can't solve it, then come to me. Come to you, brother. Have, come, have you come to Moses. Now, that sounds like a Republican government. I mean, a, a Republican type of democracy to me. Could you imagine if we had a democracy, what problems would be created in terms of getting anything done? Anybody see any problems with a democracy, a pure democracy? Volunteer, go ahead. Speak up. Mob. Say. Mob rule. What say? Mob, Mob rule. rule. Can you go ahead? The biggest problem is factions form. Factions prevent cohesiveness of anything, including. Uh, you said factions. Yeah. factions. We're going to talk was, about that a little bit later. We'll Madison. come back to Madison because he talked about that very subject jury. So, anyway, uh, so this was the beginning of the uh, process, these five months of deliberation uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, it was a very interesting environment. They were, they were in a building in the Philadelphia that the weather was 95 degrees, the soil was very hot, the windows were all closed for secrecy, and they were in that building for the better part of five months, in and out. Uh, but that process was very deliberate, and the two main issues that was holding up the completion of this convention was what? What were the two main issues? Anybody want to volunteer? One state, one vote, and slavery. Uh, now we're talking about, we're talking about now the Constitutional Convention. One slave, one vote was an issue, but that was resolved. Who said that? Nobody. Uh, uh, <laughs> That was resolved, by the way. Uh, so anyway, the uh, convention uh, ended in, uh, on September 17th, 1787, commonly known on our calendar as seven, what, Constitution Day. 
that's observed as a uh, supposed to be observed as a uh, public school holiday or an event to be celebrated. Now, what I want to do is I want to come back now and talk to you about uh, some of our very, very uh, special f founding fathers. And I picked four of them. One was Washington, another was Alexander Hamilton, another one was John Jay, and another one was James Madison. George Washington was known, in our, I know when I was growing up in school, he was known as the father of our country. He was, he was labeled as such. Uh, but George Washington was a little more than just the father. He was also a great military leader in the French Revolutionary War. Under, uh, he was on the side of the British at that time. So he gained his fame primarily through military victories, and he also was the chairman of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. And uh, I'm going to save Madison to last, but uh, Alexander Hamilton was a very, very uh, good reader, brilliant mind. He was born in the Caribbean. He was not born in the United States. He was born on one of the islands in the Caribbean. And his gift coming here was accounting. But you will see later how he became a very valuable asset in the formation of our government. Uh, James Madison, who I think was the genius of the Constitution, some people call him the father of the Constitution. He studied the, as I said earlier, he studied the forms of government for over a thousand years and why they didn't work. He came to the conclusion that with the vast landscape of this new country that we have, that a government too big is not good. A government too small is not good. A government here in the middle might be the way to solve the problem of, the, of land mass and people. And this is what he came up with, this concept of a Republican government or a representative government, constitutional republic, constitutional republic. Some people call it democracy today. Uh, it's a form of democracy. It's a representative form of democracy. It's not a pure democracy because if it was a pure democracy, Steve would be voting every other week. <laughs> amongst what, 300 million people? Can you imagine 300, people, million, 300 million people voting on an issue of Congress? I don't think so. That's why Madison came to this conclusion that the government should be shaped in such a way that will cover all aspects of a society because of land mass and because of different interest groups. And we've had this system for over 200 years now. It's worked pretty well. Uh, there were those who did not like this concept. Uh, there were those who said any government interference in our lives is no good. These are the libertarian types, if you will. But uh, then we had the Federalist groups. The Federalist groups were what? Did anybody have an idea like to volunteer what Federalism is? What's that? A strong central government. A strong central government. That's shared, right? It's a shared government. Uh, there were those who opposed it. And uh, the Federalist concept was that learning from the experience of the Confederated Congress and the experience from Britain, all the grievances that were formed, that ideally, the way to solve the problem of too much government and not enough was to come in between and come up with what we have, what we call today are the, um, uh, the government is allowed to do so many things. And it's uh, in our initial clause in the first, in the article one, uh, where we have a shared government, and it's called in, in Article One of the Constitution, enumerated powers. It's in Article One of the Constitution. Enumerated powers at the time of the convention. Guess what? 
there are only 18 things granted to the federal government under the federal system that states would benefit from. This is very puzzling. 18 different areas, post offices for the federal government, you know, money printing, all these things that would benefit the 13 states. Um, unfortunately, today, guess how many different governments, federal agencies we have? 61. With employment of 2.5 million people. That's scary. And I just saw on the news that our current president just added another 100, 200,000 jobs. Why is this a problem? Well, our Congress is supposed to have oversight and control those things that the government's operating under. And I can't imagine Congress doing their job with two and a half million people. Our government may have a weak spot here. Now, the fourth person I was going to talk about was John Jay. Now, we have Madison, who, in my opinion, was the architect of our government. He built the framework of it in terms of setting up the parameters for the, for the government as far as its width is concerned. Alexander Hamilton's reputation was one of filling the the doors, filling up the space in this big building that Madison created. And he was responsible in a Federalist system. You've heard of the Federalist Papers. There were 85 Federalist Papers written. And uh, Alexander Hamilton wrote, anybody know how many? 51. Uh, 51. Who said that? Said, somebody say 51? Oh, I know you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, Madison wrote 29, and John Jay wrote 5. Now, John Jay's contribution as a founding father was, he was uh, very critical of the Articles of Confederation. In, in the Articles of Confederation, he wrote five. He wrote five of them. Four of them cover his critique of the Articles of Confederation. And, and the fifth one was, uh, had something to do with land mass. But his contribution to this country was, he was responsible for negotiating a peace treaty with Britain in 1783, four years before the Constitution was written. And in this, uh, John Jay's contribution was he, he negotiated a peace treaty with France in 1783, and not, not in, in Paris, with Britain. And in that peace treaty, he not only got the separation from Great Britain, but this is puzzling to me. I think further research should be done. But Great Britain gave them the land mass that they had won from the French in the French Revolution or the French Indian War, which spanned all the way from, uh, you know, the East Coast to west to the Mississippi, all the way down to northern Florida. In a peace treaty in Paris in 1783, all this. Land was, was included in the negotiations for our country. So now we not only have peace with Britain, but we got all this land. That's a fantastic piece of land from New England to Mississippi River and then south to Florida. And John Jay also was very instrumental in negotiating peace with Spain because there were problems because Spain controlled the Mississippi River and he's also responsible for working with the French uh, to uh, with Spain to make sure that uh, the, the you know, navigation of boats was completed successfully. Uh, he also was the first Supreme Court Justice 
and later resigned as a Supreme Court Justice to become governor of New York. Interesting career. But anyway, these four people, I think, were very instrumental. Uh, can't certainly depreciate the other people that contributed, but their contributions were all in themselves very specific. Uh, Madison being the architect, Hamilton being the person that filled the gaps for our government to form it. Uh, George Washington was a great military leader and also the leader, or, or he was in charge of the Constitutional Convention. And of course, John Jay with his negotiating skills and his able to work with uh, foreign governments to, to bring us to this great land that we have right now. Now, how are we doing on time? Run out of the bump now. Uh, I would just like to say, before we go open up the audience for questions, uh, that the part that I think we should take a look at also is the potential collision points within the Constitution itself. For example, we have the Tenth Amendment, not the Tenth Amendment, but we have the, uh, yeah, the Tenth Amendment, which is the amendment for what? Anybody know the Tenth Amendment here? What it deals with? States' rights. I didn't hear that. States' rights. State sovereignty. State sovereignty. But why is there a problem in the Constitution with the Tenth Amendment? We just experienced it with the Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court made a judgment that was not their judgment, it was a state's judgment. Remember, they rescinded the law because it was not within the privy of the responsibility of the Supreme Court. It's again Madison talking about keeping our government under control with the separation of powers. The three different departments have each their own independent responsibility, but also be overseers of each other. And uh, so therefore, the uh, Tenth Amendment and the uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the enumerated powers that's given the government 18 in our Constitution, 18 different areas of responsibility. And I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. We currently have 61 agencies with 2.5 million employees, and it's growing. I'm not sure the founders had this intention to have this big government. So were the anti-federalists may be right to some degree. They had some reason for objection because some of the things that they were worried about are now happening. The government's getting too big and out of hand. And in closing, I would say, what is it that we can do? Is there anything we can do in a small way? If we have 25 million Christians, so-called Christians, not voting, we got to do some talking. If we have people who think that they don't play a role in government, they have to be talked to. That lady in that booth, she was serious when she said, the government's not here, it's in Washington. Do you know people that say that? That's scary. And our people that we send to Congress hold their hand up to uphold the Constitution. You know what? I think one of three things. They don't know it. They don't, or they don't care. They're just going to ignore it. Our current governor, uh, Polis, here in Colorado, I attended uh, one of his uh, coffees when he first started running for the House of Representatives. And I was sitting to Kevin Lundberg, maybe many of you know Kevin Lundberg. And we asked uh, Jared Polis, uh, do you think that uh, what the government's currently doing might be a violation of the 10th Amendment? You know what his answer was? He said, I don't worry about things like that. He said, we have 450 people in Congress that'll take, they're all lawyers. They're taking an oath to uphold the Constitution. They don't know it. 
And guess where these people are coming from to go to Congress? They're coming from your neighborhoods. We have to place a greater emphasis on scrutinizing the candidates that go to Congress. We've got to make sure that they understand their obligations. And this is not a particular party issue. Currently, uh, in our government today, we have continuance of violations of the Constitution at all levels for the president down through Congress. They're either ignoring it or they don't care it's happening. They, they don't care. That's scary because a philosopher once said is where you have no lines, you have no order, you have chaos. And our society is moving in that direction right now because we're not obeying the laws. And we people, you and I, have an obligation to do our parts. Even if just telling your neighbor, you are the government, you need to vote, that's, that's a big contribution. We also have a group that's formed here in Loveland uh, that has a mixture of people from different congregations in different parts of town. It's called the Christians Engaging the Public Square. And this group was formed to start gaining, having our people in this community begin to gain awareness of the things that are going on with our government and our educational departments and in our libraries. And by the way, this group is going to be challenging. The first step is going to be education. That's the first challenge. We need to become more informed of what's going on around us in our government. And this group intends to provide opportunities for that to happen. And Emmanuel will be used as a pilot church on this subject. And by the way, uh, give you an example. It just happened here a short time ago about how in a little way we might start challenging. Uh, uh, Paul Hind would like to say something about this. Hi. This, um, this is really my wife. So the I in this statement that I'm going to read is, uh, is, is my wife, Gail. Um, in preparation for Columbus Day, I wanted to get a picture group book for my first graders. In the past, I have owned several books about his life but, and travels, but I no longer did. The books I reserved online turned out to be more advanced than I needed. So I went looking through the library, uh, library's online catalog, and then on the shelf. There were no picture books, books that are to, to be read, allowed to tell a story, available at our library. There were only two or three avail available to be ordered from other libraries. On the nonfiction shelves, there was one book for young children telling about Columbus Day holiday. There were several other available books for older readers. Of those, many indicated in the title a critical assessment of him. I was looking for a book to help tell the story of his life and his explorations. When I asked the librarian, I told her it appeared that the shelves have been scrubbed and perhaps I was asking for a banned book. <laughs> she assured me that that wouldn't be the case and that she would convey my question to the children's librarian. A topic like Columbus's exploration has been treated in the past without acknowledging the poor treatment of the native people. But that is not the reason to avoid his story and his bravery as an explorer. The story of his failure is also instructional for the children. Thank you, Paul. That's just a sampling of what's going on in our society. There's a number of other items that are going on in the library that Pastor Ed Seeley probably could talk about, um, but that's probably for another time. Uh, I might say that if you're interested in learning more about this group called Christians Engaging the Public Square, and I don't misunderstand the word engaging. Uh, engaging does not necessarily uh, indicate that there's going to be a, a very aggressive approach to the public. But the first step of this engaging is education, and that's what the, this group is going to be focusing on. And if you would like to learn more about that, feel free to stop by and talk to me afterwards. And um, 
now we can open up this group for questions. I'll do the best I can to answer if I can. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I, I, your comment about uh, the increase in size and scope of the federal government is certainly readily visible. Uh, yes. And there are I mean, in one sense, you could argue that because of the growth of population and the growth of technology that a lot of new agencies were required to regulate on a national scale, like broadcasting, like the FCC and the uh, drug uh, manufacturing, the FDA, and things like that. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, there, it seems like in some cases, of like the EPA and others, that, uh, yeah, they have become unelected overseers with absolute power. And that, I think, is a problem. But another aspect of this problem of federal overreach has been the courts. And that's why the liberals have been so, up until recently, uh, uh, eager to use the courts to bypass the democratic process because they know that they can't win on uh, a, a lot of their more radical agendas by popular votes of the people. So they go to the court system to dictate to the rest of us and to the other branches of government, by the way, <laughs> what is now going to be the right of land. And a prime example of that, post row was uh, Roberto Pell versus Hodges in 2015, which forced all states to recognize gay marriage whether or not they had any existing laws on their books stating that you know, marriage was between one man and one woman. I think 30-some states had those laws on their books. They were all wiped away by this one decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. And I, uh, you know, I guess it gets to a point where, um, well, what if you have a runaway federal government? What do you do then? And there is this little known and, and so far unused provision for that case. Is, it's called Article 5, and that's where it gives the power to the states to convene if they have enough, I think they need at least three quarters of the states to sign on to this convention, so that would be 37 states, um, and if at least, I think, two-thirds of them agree on a particular course of action. You're talking about commission, no, not a convention. A convention. A convention, if you're talking about the Constitution, it requires two thirds of the state to agree. And when the amendments are processed, it then takes three fourths of the state houses to approve them. Okay. Uh, That's in the Constitution, by the way. It's in the Federalist Papers also. Yeah, so uh, Kevin Lundberg had been talking about this Article 5 convention. Yes, they states, trying, they call it Convention of the States. Of the states that they've been yeah. trying for years to get together. Yeah. Has there been any? Uh, progress for getting enough states to sign on to that yet. You know? Well, Kevin Lundberg, uh, if my recollection is correct, uh, fell short about, they needed two-thirds of the states, and I think they ran short about five or six states. But there's a time limit on this request. If you don't get these delegates together in a certain time to have a convention, you've got to start over. And that's where we're at right now. In fact, the governor of Texas, I think, was involved we're trying to get a convention of the states. I don't know where that stands right now. But it takes two-thirds of the states to get a convention of the states, okay. and three-fourths of the state houses to approve any amendments to the Constitution. Okay. Now, the same process, now that's a convention of the states, where the states call. The other option, of course, is in the, in the Congress, where Congress wants to institute an amendment to the Constitution. The same process, three-fourths, uh, rather two-thirds and three-fourths. Two thirds of the Congress have to agree, and then they, they, they put the amendment up for a vote, and then it has to be approved by the three fourths of the state houses in the country. So yeah, that's that's one way of doing it. Of course, I, I think those who have been watching television over the last few months have seen what's going on in Virginia, the state of Virginia in education, where there's been an uprising with parents over the subject matter that the schools are teaching. I mean, these are, this is evidence of what we can do because we are in the majority. We are the government. We're the people. Yes, sir. Uh, just to build on this gentleman's comment,
and um, Dad, I think what you highlighted in your talk about the founding fathers is particular to Madison, the brilliance of his work was not the two-house system of government because that was in place for hundreds of years yeah. prior to the American Constitution. Madison also added the judiciary and the executive branch to the four pillars of government. And what you're saying, which is true, that those, those two additional branches were put in place to be checks and balances Just. for all of the other branches of government. And many of the problems that we have today are coming back to overreach of one of those yep. departments in, in their scope of what they were designed to do. So you talked about judicial overreach when it comes to certain issues where the, the judiciary is in place to determine if something is constitutional or not, not to create legislation. Dad, you alluded to a couple things about executive power. The number of executive orders that have been signed by presidents, meaning that there's no legislative deliberation, it's just an order, has increased sequentially with the last four presidents to the point where they're almost doubling with each president after. And that's in independent of Democrat or Republican affiliation, by the way. The number of executive orders that have been signed continue to double. So that's basically taking all of the work that the founding fathers put into the Constitution as it relates to checks and balances and nullifying them. And that's why your point, Dad, about voting and advocacy in the public square to challenge thinking is so important. Thank you for your elongated explanation. I appreciate that, Mark. Uh, I want to comment what you said, which is correct, what you said, that Madison was responsible. I think it was a Federalist 86, I forget which Federalist paper it was, it talks about uh, the idea of separation of powers and that these powers are limited to each group, but they also have the responsibility to look at each other if they're violating. Now, uh, Another misconception uh, on our courts, by the way, uh, Alexander Hamilton was the one that had the idea, one of the rooms that he built was the judiciary, the Supreme Court, he was responsible for that. But uh, one of the misconceptions we have also in the public is that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of a decision. Do you agree with that? It's not correct. No. Supreme Court is not the final arbiter. Anybody like to volunteer who is? The people. The people. And who's the people? The people. Congress. 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 It states in the law, Congress and the people, the representatives. Now, um, we have these violations. You alluded to a mark of uh, executive orders. I checked out. Is there a way we can check the president? What's the check against the president on executive orders? Now, the original intent of the founders for executive orders was emergencies. It wasn't giving you the freedom that your agenda is not passed by Congress, that you do it through the executive powers. How do we check that? Now, the way I read it, there's two checks. One is Congress can stop that executive order, or the courts can, which they've already done. They have stopped executive orders. Or uh, we can, uh, the next president can erase them when he comes into office. Those are three options. Any other questions? Go ahead, Marsha. Where, where is the uh, Federal Reserve authorized in the Constitution? I, I don't know if it's authorized in the Constitution. I can only say that one of the contributions of Alexander Hamilton was he set up the banking system. He set up our banking system, and I'm not sure if it's connected to that. I don't. I haven't read anywhere in the Constitution where yeah, since they, they, Federal Reserve comes into play. Since they can print money, I thought it had to be somewhere in there. <laughs> so. Well, I don't know, maybe, uh, but I, I have not seen anything on the Federal Reserve. All I know is that in the basic structure of our government, 
that Hamilton was responsible for setting up our banking systems, our economic programs. So, Kathy? So, Dad, you said that the Harvard and Yale editorial writing in the New York Times said they wanted to get rid of the Constitution, and we're hearing that a lot lately. And so, Boy. based on what we're hearing today, I'm thinking, did you set up reasons why, but how would you answer the reason about why they want to get rid of the that's a very excellent question. Thank you, sweetheart. I call her, she's my daughter. Well, <laughs> um, so, uh, if James Madison was here today, you know what he would have told his professors? He would have waved his finger at him and say, you gentlemen did not read Federalist 10. Because he talked about factions in Federalist 10. Federalist 10 talks about these extreme views. And in essence, what he was saying is that when po politicians can't get their agendas passed, they attack the system. You see what I'm saying? They're now, because they can't get their, the system's not right to get their agenda correct. So we therefore have to modify or get rid of the Constitution so we get our agenda passed. This has been working for over 200 years. Madison did not, this was not his conception of our government. If you don't like the way the Constitution is working, maybe it's time to call a constitutional convention, and this is what they're alluding to, to break the Constitution. Dad, I have the answer on that question about the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 established the Federal Reserve System as the central bank of the United States. It's through the central bank. Yeah, see, again, yeah, this is Hamilton's it's, it's a contribution. Private, it's a private organization, is it not? Uh, the Federal Reserve Act implies that it's a piece of legislation that was passed, but it's, yeah, it's not making a reference to an amendment in the Constitution. Well, we've covered uh, our first hour here. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, if you'd like to continue, we can. But we can also I'll offer the invitation to talk more at another session. Go ahead, Cheryl. I'm just going to say I'd like to keep having this. To keep I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Part. I would like, if you could keep having something like this to keep learning. Do it again? Yeah. Because there's a lot of detail. If you looked at your handout, oh, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's almost 200 years of history. And it's in chronological order. And uh, it might take three or four sessions to complete the co discussion. But So you would say you'd like to hear more. Jim, are you counting the hands? <laughs> They'd like to hear more, I'd gather in. So we can put this on our agenda, perhaps? For young at hearts? OK. Thank you, folks. Um, I also want to come back to your handout on the, the books that uh, I'm recommending. The summer of 1787, if you, it's, a, it's kind of three or four hundred pages, but it's, it's like a movie. So what you do is you go to Philadelphia every morning with your delegates from these 48 states, uh, not 48, 13 states, and you're getting the exchange for every day of the five month period in that book. You're reading it, It's very interesting. Go ahead, Judy. I was going to have a thought. Edgar Emanuel, uh, Edgar Emanuel was the author of the Do you have those with you? No, I didn't think of it. Okay. It anyway, time. what we could do is we could channel through Young at Hearts, Jim. Would that be okay? Okay. All right. She offered to bring them Sunday. I'll bring them this Sunday. Yeah. So okay. what would you, just set them on a table or? Uh, I don't know. I, this was just kind of off of my head. How would that, that work? We need to have that out more. Okay. Yeah. So what would you like to hear in your next session? Is it maybe you'd like to think about it, let us know, or 
Is that it? Pardon? Who to vote for? I I didn't hear that. Golf course? Oh, the election? Yeah. You want to talk about the election? Yeah. Uh, she said whom to vote for. People are asking for an opinion for whom to vote for. I don't think I would like to participate in that. Uh, is there any other ideas that you might want to hear? Judy. You know, there, there was something I was involved in uh, years ago also. It's an organization, and they would put out a brochure, and they would compare um, the presidential candidates uh, or whatever. Okay. Um, of what they have voted for, what, what they believe in, and, and you could compare the two. So it's not like you standing up there telling us who to vote for, right. but giving us more information about the yeah. issues and what they uh, believe in. Judy, you realize the election's in two weeks. <laughs> I, got, I got a book a week ago, two weeks ago, of candidates in the state of Colorado. And I got one last week for Well County. Did anybody else get those? No. Yes. Yes, Paul. I, I would like to hear, uh, you know, somebody mentioned Article 5 and, and just go down each article of the Constitution and say, this is what this says. Okay, uh, the article's interesting point, uh, quite long, uh, each article has subsections. Like, for example, Article 8 covers a number of different topics. So but, but we just, might spend the whole evening a, on Article 1. Well, well, just give a summary of each article. Would yeah. be. Is that what you'd like to hear? Yeah. Okay. That one suggestion would be expanding on <clears throat> the composition of the Bill of Rights by Madison yes. and maybe expanding a little bit further on the 18 agencies that were created in the original Constitution as a way of drawing contrast to what we have today. That might be an interesting subject. Yeah. yeah. But the, what was your first statement about? Bill of Rights. Expansion oh, of similar. The, the drafting of the Bill of Rights. Oh, that's very important because, you know, the Bill of Rights did not exist at the time of the writing of the Constitution. Right. Right. It didn't come until 1791 was ratified. So that was, what, how many years? 87, four years later. But the Bill of Rights is so important. And by the way, that's one of the items, as we mentioned earlier, that was holding up the convention, is that they did not want to leave that convention without the Bill of Rights or the issue of slavery. Those two items were not covered. The Bill of Rights was covered in 1791. It took four years to get that finished. And the slavery didn't stop until, what, 816 something? What was it? Seven? Yeah, I was, I was suggesting that expanding that discussion on the actual composition of the Bill of Rights and what's in it. Yeah. And then maybe a, a discussion of the 18 original agencies that were called for in the Constitution yeah. so people are aware of what those are. Yeah. And then I think that would draw a nice contrast to what we have today where you made the point of now we have 61 agencies yeah. as opposed to 18 and 2.5 million employees, yeah. etc. The interesting thing about the enumeration of powers in Article 1 is that these are all items that were drawn up for, for federal responsibility, federal system, that the states could benefit from. Right now they're doing things that states don't benefit from. In fact, there's a lot of impediment going on right now. So, so anyway, uh, we've so noted some of the thoughts, Pastor.
And we have the same problem here in this discussion that we're talking about pertaining to the Constitution, such as uh, the Dobbs case and uh, Alberta Bell and the Congress, uh, the interpretation, finding something in the, uh, reading into the Constitution rather than drawing out. And we have the same problem in the church. Thanks be to God, not this congregation, but in churches across the denominations where there's, there are hermeneutical errors being made in interpreting scripture, reading into the text rather than drawing out of the text, the original meaning. It's a huge issue, and it's why so many people are confer confused about Dobbs' case this year, thinking that the, the Supreme Court overruled the uh, outlawed abortion. I personally wish that was the case, but, uh, <laughs> but they didn't do that. All they did was say it's not in the Constitution because of a proper hermeneutic. And we need to do the same thing. I, we, I wish we could address that. Very interesting point because it comes back to the Constitution. Is that when we appoint Supreme Court justices, if you recall the print in the newspapers, there's two categories of concern. One is the concern of the originalists going back to the Constitution to the other side, which is more evolutionary. The Constitution's not current, so therefore we have to bring in current circumstances. This was not the intent of our founders, but it has a religious and constitutional issue because hermeneutics is a science of starting of origins, studying origins, how far does it go back. Now we can take our religious study in the Bible, for example, and we can go in the Old Testament and find something that appears in the mid-Old Testament and in the New Testament so that the word is consistent in the Bible. There's no error. We believe that. But there's no error in the Bible because of whatever said in the Old Testament is confirmed in the New Testament. So this is the science of hermeneutics. In terms of government, today, there is no... Some of these folks don't want to return back to the original intent of our founders, and this is where we have a problem. We have agenda pushing. Can I just add to what I, what I just said? Uh, another reason why this is especially important is because more and more people are, are leaving the church. The church attendance is uh, declining. The more people ignore God, they get their sense of what's right and wrong from what the law says. And so they say, well, this must be okay because it's legal. Well, that's, that is not good reason. Yeah. And so this is another reason why so I would entertain one or two more questions, and if you'd like to stop by and talk further, I'll be glad to answer any questions afterwards. Is there any other? Go ahead, Jerry. I just wanted to say not a question, more of a statement. But art has been so instrumental in focusing on this, uh, you know, engaging the public square. It's been, I bet he's lost sleep over it even, but he is. He's got something concrete going in that group, and we uh, survey went out to people, but this is a perfect example of what that group should be doing, and that's education, trying to get everybody to understand the basics of what you need to know, just like biblical principles, to understand what is the reality of the situation, and you have been the champion. I just wanted to Thank you, Jerry, for the comments. Thank you again for all coming, and uh, you'll learn further from uh, the Young at Hearts planning group as to where we go from here. Thank you, Jerry. As a way to express our feelings after this reminder of how wonderful this country is that God has given us, it came to me. Sure. Let us say the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks for There's no flag present, okay? but if you wouldn't mind, okay? let's stand and pledge our allegiance to our country. Here we go. I pledge allegiance. I didn't cover the ice sheet. I didn't cover the ice sheet.